say this on air. We have to remember to turn off the video feed from the other side of the room because the internet right now is on a precipice over here. We're in, we're out, we're up, we're down. How's my video feed? Am I? It's actually okay. really good. Yeah, you're not blurring yes. it. Yeah, good, cool. It's the best it's been for a while. That's a good sign. <laughs> that is a good sign. I'm actually wired into the wall right now for the first time in a while. Um, that's because I'm here in Austin, in my office, ready to do a show. Matt, you ready to do a show? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I am. I am ready. I'm looking forward to this. So awesome. don't spoil it. <laughs> Either of you. <laughs> Hello, dearies. Welcome to episode 80. Oh! <laughs> I spoiled it. Uh, episode 79, actually. We have a good show for you today because I was trying to skip an episode number, but Matt said, no, that's not what you should do. This is a professional gig. Let's keep yeah. it honest. Strictly monotonic. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> um, There's not many radio shows you'll hear with that aim. <laughs> That's all we can hope for. That's as good as it gets here on this show. Yeah. Um, what's this now? Um, I can't even. I can't even say the words. What's your first bullet point? What do you mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Break the news. <laughs> Break the news. Get, to anyone who hasn't already heard it. GitHub three sixty five. The uh, the GitHub. What was the the best thing I saw today was the, the GitHub you know, paperclip. It looks like you're having trouble with a merge. <laughs> yeah. So Microsoft have bought GitHub sounds like for seven and a half billion dollars, making a few people really happy, I should think. But most people really sad, it seems like. Yeah. Um, I watched a really good uh <laughs> a really good what do you call it, live stream from last night by the GitLab sort of core team. Uh, -huh. uh mainly the GitLab CEO, I can't remember his name. Uh Dutch chap. Anyway, it's uh, I haven't been paying a lot of attention to GitLab, I must admit. And it's worth seeking out. I'll put I'll put it in the show notes. Um if if you want to get caught up on GitLab, which it seems like a lot of people are doing. Um they said they were getting three thousand what did he say? Something like 500 signups an hour last night. And that was just after the story had broken. So I imagine they're experiencing some growth, um, you know, hiccups and stuff over the next day or two, maybe give them 48 hours to get their act together. But it's pretty fun. It's going to be interesting to see what happens next few weeks. So if anyone needs help migrating to GitLab or Bitbucket, uh, let us know. Oh yeah, Bitbucket. What else is there? What are your other options? I don't. I only ever use GitHub and Bitbucket. Yeah, I know a lot of open source people have had reservations. Have always had reservations about GitHub. What What do you guys use at Xpero? Can you say? Bitbucket. You have like a corporate uh, Bitbucket that. Yep. Is yeah. Yep. It works the same as GitHub. Um, the thing, hey, here's the thing, Bitbucket, since I know there's 10,000 of your employees watching this show right now. Uh, you like how I say watching this show when it's a radio show? Um, come on, render notebooks already, please. Hmm. I wonder, I tried to find out if GitLab does that. Do you know if they do? I don't know. I Watch saw this. someone, I guess because it's open source, you can, you can hack around at least with your own deployments of GitLab. Um, so I saw some kind of hacky add-ons that will render notebooks. That's what I found. Just they now. came. <laughs> they come one of the with things like <laughs> the readme sort of say things like, I, you know, I don't know about the security of this, or it's not very fast. So anyway, that would be a big thing. Hey, I have one news bullet point. Okay, let's let's turn that frown upside down. Xperia is having a Women in Technology Hackathon on July 20. My notes say here the 29th to the 29th. Let me just edit that to say the 28th to the 29th. Um, the theme is machine learning as a product. So there's a link in the show notes. You should check that out. Machine learning as a product, to me, what it means, and this is this 
doesn't have to be what it means for you if you're participating. That at the end of the show, you will have a thing that you can, uh, that folks can use. And that doesn't mean it's commercial. It doesn't necessarily mean it's even software. It could be a set of juggling balls or something. I don't know how that relates to machine learning, but I would love to see a bunch of people end up with physical things from a hackathon. That'd be cool. So um, the night before, the the afternoon before, from I believe 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., there is a data science or slash machine learning uh, ask me anything happy hour here at our office where I am. And we're going to have wine and cheese. And anybody that wants to, sh all these things are free, by the way. Anyone that wants to show up can just come on over and um, ask us questions. We're going to have the data science team over here and a whiteboard and um, fire away. Hmm, very cool. So it's at it's at Expera's office, mm -hmm. and um, the happy hour is the okay. hackathon's not. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about the happy hour actually, to be honest, because we keep talking to a bunch of people who say I want to do machine learning, mm -hmm. but I don't know what that means. Like I don't know how to get started, kind of. Yeah. Thing? Yeah, I don't know how to get started. I don't actually know what it is. I don't know what a data strategy is. I don't know what MongoDB means. Uh, just come say hello and ask me those questions. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, it for me. I, I I think that I was, like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of speed bumps on the way to mastery of anything, I guess, but. It's the first speed bump is is the biggest. I feel like a lot of people spend, actually can spend years going, I really want to learn R or Python or figure out this machine learning malarkey. Yep. And uh, yeah, years go by. And, it, and, and once you're on the other side of that bump, you look back and you're like, wow, there's so many ways to get started. What was, what was wrong with me? But there's that inertia, you know, I, I don't know how to help people, help nudge them over that first that first hump. I, I, like, I think it comes down to finding a, a project which you can essentially only do by yeah. learning to code and mm -hmm. being passionate enough about it to, you know, sustain you through the early days of not having a clue what's going on 99% of the time instead of just 90% of the time. This... <laughs> My goal with this happy hour is not just to talk about technical aspects of the code and the database varieties and stuff. It's, I, I hope that people show up and ask questions like, how do I, what, what projects can my organization use machine learning on? All yeah, right. Anyway, cool. what's happening with you? Um, well, we uh, just announced that we're doing some uh, things in the UK in the autumn. Mm -hmm. So uh, towards the end of September and first week in October, we're doing some courses in mm -hmm. Croydon, which is a, a suburb of London, essentially, um, and in Aberdeen. They will be completely free, these courses. They are, are Agile's that's to say Agile's five-day um, intro to machine learning for geoscientists course, but they've been paid for, or they will have been paid for, by the uh, the Oil and Gas Authority, which is a sort of autonomous um, department of the U UK government, essentially. Um, I think it's actually a, a British Crown Corporation type thing. Anyway, uh, Really nice opportunity for 40 people, I think, to get some free training. And then we're following them up with a couple of hackathons right before the Petex conference, which is a biennial um, petroleum show uh, that's in London. So yeah, geocomputing.xyz is the URL to go to if you wish to register your interest in those courses. And there's a, a register your interest means um, so it's, it's you could kind of think of it as an application. Uh, it, if we're oversubscribed and it looks like we're going to be um, oversubscribed on the first day <laughs> of taking registrations, 
um, the OJ is going to select people essentially for this course. So the more compelling your your reason for wanting to do the course, um, if you put yourself in the OGA's shoes, you know they want to see people doing awesome things with UK data, uh, and preferably, you know, publishing them, getting them out there. Then, uh, you know, the more likely you are to be selected for a uh, for a place. That's all I'll say. Cool. Yeah. That's, that's all for me. I, I want to get to our, I want to get to our guest. Okay. Well, our guest today. Speaking of machine learning and statistics and some other cool stuff, is Dr. Michael Perch. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Michael is a professor at the University of Texas here in Austin. He is on Twitter and my <laughs> Microsoft GitHub here. I see that Matt has written in. Um, links to those uh, references and his website are on the show notes, so check them out. Um, what is going on? Michael, where are you? I'm at campus in my office. I never go home. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a brand new professor. I am just trapped here. Yes, Michael, indeed. Michael, which campus are you on? So I'm out on the main campus. Which one is that? It's, it's called the 40 Acres. <laughs> which one is that? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. okay, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> so um, right near downtown, just north of downtown. Ah, uh, okay, cool, gotcha. Yeah, yep, awesome, yes. <laughs> do the people, what do you call the other campus then? Pickle. Pickle? Yeah. Okay, or or BEG, or the BEG? Yeah, BEG is just one of the facilities out there. There's a uh, geophysics okay. institute, there's all kinds of other laboratories that they just don't have room for on the 40 acres. Now, anybody out there, any Longhorns, if I got any of this wrong, I'm brand new, I'm sorry. So, but it's, uh, has it got any other names? Like you guys have a few names, the 100 acres? <laughs> I think it's just 40 acres here. I don't think okay. we take acres elsewhere. <laughs> well, it's never too late to start introducing weird terms that no one else has heard. <laughs> I don't so think we... I can influence the traditions of UT. They're pretty strong. Yeah, we I don't have... know. Well, you don't know how many listeners we have. Oh, I didn't realize. Oh, I'm going to be famous now. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's not that's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> two two more people will know who you are. Where? Okay, so we covered where are you literally? I'm reading through the show notes here, line by line. <laughs> How did you get there? Figuratively, <laughs> Matt, you did a good job. So so how did I get here? How did how did I become a professor, or how do I commute? Yes. So um, I actually have 13 years of experience working in industry in R and D. And uh, about a, a little while ago, um, there was an opportunity to do some guest lecturing at UT, some discussions, and um, there was some enthusiasm around me applying to come here. And boy, you know, UT is awesome. Um, seemed like a great opportunity. But um, I definitely loved what I was doing in industry. There's a part of me that's still there, for sure. It's um, I wish there was two universes I could live both lives. <laughs> yeah. What well, like um, when when I think back to my corporate life I admit I do miss the data sets <laughs> yeah yep yeah. the data sets um exceptional uh folks to work with as far as um you'll have world-class experts I was part of ETC the energy technology company within Chevron um everybody on my floor are, like very exceptional people people type of people I'd cite it well during my PhD and I got mm -hmm. to work with them and so you know it's just a very nice atmosphere it's also very um collaborative everybody mm -hmm. wins together I really enjoy that atmosphere too. Yeah, right. What are you working um, on over there? So what am I working on right now at, on campus? Yep. So, well, uh, first year as a professor. So um, there's going to be a lot of time um, preparing new course material. I have mm -hmm. taught two brand new courses, one each term. I think next year I'll have a little bit of reprieve. I'll teach the same courses over, so that'll be quite a bit different. But I was literally preparing course notes some um, hours before lectures, you know, just like through the night and then right before lectures and then all the other things, starting out with brand new PhD students, yeah. um, trying to get my own research going, uh, funding, of course, I'm in Houston almost every second week, knocking on doors, meeting everyone who will talk to me. So it's very busy as a brand new professor. Oh, wow. Yeah. You don't think of professors as having to do kind of business development. <laughs> Or whatever you would call it, oh, yeah. funding development. But that's actually a nice thing about coming from industry is that you'll be very aware of the problems. I was part mm. of the technology center. I know how to communicate. 
understand how they fund, how they um, value technology, how to demonstrate that. So that's very helpful. Mm, awesome. What uh, What's your impression of the ratio of preparation time to lecture slash lab time? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll give a couple of comments. First of all, um, you realize very quickly you can't baffle 60 students who are all top end engineers. You can't baffle them. You, you have to actually know the material. So I knew statistics. I knew probability theory. Um, the class I teach is all fundamental statistics up to geostatistics. And I learned that I had to really dig in and learn it more than I knew it before. And um, mm. so I think eight to one, 10 to one, mm. maybe 15 to one, depending on the lecture. The thing is, I, I one thing I like to do is I have lecture material, but then I'll have a lot of examples worked up in R and Python. I'll put together Markdown with lots of documentation. I like preparing very complete slides. I'm trying to share those slides online. So I like to prepare and, and provide the students with a lot of um, a lot of resources so that they're able to work through the assignments and learn the material. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you've just the stuff you've been um, sharing on Twitter has been been really something. Uh, have you had? I mean, I, I've seen that you've had lots of likes and retweets and stuff. Have you had any, um, you know, like more direct feedback or or people sharing stuff back to you and that kind of thing? Yeah, there's been lots of great engagement. So um, this discussion right here, why did it happen? Why do I have um, two chapters in your, well, a recent chapter in your book, right, that we're preparing together on geocomputing? That's because of our contacts on Twitter. Why was I able to be part of that um, hackathon just a couple of weeks ago at APG and Judge, right? But even more directly, it's amazing. I was in a discussion recently with um, Anna Darko with their Midland group, their business unit out there. There are three people in the discussion, all of them senior engineers for the business unit. All three of them follow me on Twitter. Oh, really? And wow. so as we were discussing, basically, mm -hmm. when we came to the part of, okay, what do you do? It basically, it was easy. They were all like, we know exactly what you do. You're transparent. We see what you're putting out on Twitter. We can go to your resources. We like what you're doing. We want to work with you. We want you to come and train our people. It was, it was exceptional. Twitter, I see it as a wonderful opportunity to engage with the scientific community and the folks in industry, which are all part of the scientific community. Has your work always been that open? <laughs> so that's a great question, right? Like um, when you work within a company, you are, you know, you are completely um, within that system. And I worked as I could within an IP structure and strategy to publish as much as I could to, I wrote a book, I, I did, I think, 30 something peer review publications and so forth. But it's not the same. When you're in academia, I can literally prepare a lecture. I can write a brand new research idea. I can immediately put it out there. I can crowdsource everything I do. And, and I honestly, I'm seeing huge value in doing that. It, it forms brand new partnerships. It's just excellent. I'm, I'm gonna be working with a lot of other professors in other universities because of this. And I, it's the same thing, we all win together, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. What did you think of of Twitter while you were still at Chevron? Did Pro you ever think about? Yeah, so I didn't start until last August. I was convinced by one of my friends um, who was working as a data scientist within Chevron to kind of get started with it. And um, to be honest, I probably had the same reaction as any of my most of my engineering students because um, I suggest to them that they should think about Twitter, that they should look at Twitter, and I even tell them that I'll put resources out there if they want to follow me. And they just make jokes about it because they don't see the scientific side of it. They think it's just political um, gossip. And so that's one thing I actually do is I tell my students about the value of being um, out there. You know, the way I see it, the way you're seen within a company is proportional to the way you're seen outside of a company. So you have to be out there. You have to be presenting yourself. People have to know you outside the company. And I think Twitter is a great way to do that. I, within the company, you always want to be careful always be got to be respectful you careful not to represent the company and careful what you release of course mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. awesome yeah no I, I you know it's a while since i wrote anything on the blog about um sort of social media and stuff people my perception is that people feel quite comfortable um on linkedin like that seems to be an accepted it's like okay if someone sees over your shoulder that you're asking around in linkedin that's fine but um, yeah, most people seem pretty skeptical about um, about Twitter and- Most companies would block Twitter. Oh, is that right? Yeah, really? you would not be able to access Twitter from your desktop. Huh. Yeah. 
Interesting. It's Interesting. just like Facebook. Facebook and Twitter would be blocked. Yeah, right. But I mean, it's such a, I mean, yeah, maybe Facebook, I kind of understand. Uh, but I mean, I, maybe there's a sciencey side to Facebook. I have no idea. But um, yeah, my perception of Twitter is just this completely other thing, like an incredibly useful professional tool that LinkedIn is nowhere near for me. Yep. yep. <laughs> I agree. Well, if you looked at LinkedIn, most of us use it just as a way to kind of keep our CV out there. Yeah, right. Or as a way to get someone's like email or phone number. Yeah, yeah. If you need to, if you need to kind of creep someone and figure out who's this person I met at a conference, you can go to LinkedIn. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Anyway, either of you deleted your Facebooks? No, no, no. I did. Because of the data thing. I, well, just the yeah, the more or less continuous stream of oh yeah. By the way, we also do that with your personal data. <laughs> yeah, there's another one today. There's another one today about um, well, all I saw was the rebuttal, like why we think the New York Times is wrong from Facebook. Yeah. They, they, they basically said that they're sharing like deep uh, personal friend type, the graph basically, oh. with some of the apps that plug into Facebook, which I, I mean, is not really surprising. It's the whole value, like the value of Facebook is the graph. Yeah. But anyway. I, 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 you know, Did you? No, but uh, no, I didn't. I barely use it, to be honest. But everything you put out there, you know, they're they're finding value in it. Yeah, we kind of knew. Right. What it's we were not just Facebook. Yeah. No, right. I mean, yeah, I'm sure Twitter and LinkedIn are just like, thank goodness for Facebook. <laughs> yeah, <that's exciting. laughs> uh, I mean, I I would argue that I'm I'm going to make the claim that it's even worse on Twitter because it's a public API, there are, as far as I know, there, there aren't private uh, relationships on Twitter, are there? There's hidden accounts, I guess. Uh, well, um, you can, you, so anyway, so you can extract the social graph from any user, right. as long as it's not a hidden user, I suppose, from Twitter. I wonder if there's as much details. Yeah. Like about your personal relationships and so forth, right? It's just people you follow. Is there more? Well, if those people are share, if, if the I mean, you can get biographies and you yeah. can get uh, their shared information on the, on the, from the public facing site. Yeah, I mean, it's the value with an API. The value comes from the likes, really, doesn't it? It's, uh, and who you're connected to and who you interact with, you can infer a lot of the stuff you need to know. I guess the the fact that it's I don't know what is it an order an order of magnitude two orders of magnitude fewer users maybe it's still um, a bleep load of users that's uh, true. Yep. Anyway, anyway. Well, social media for you so don't do anything I wouldn't do on social media please well, so I think you know as a professor when I talk to the young engineers I, I tell them I remind them you know behave professionally yep you know just behave professionally just remember who you are and you know we all have to be professional so you're saying we should delete this podcast hey we've, <laughs> we've been professional so far <laughs> you have you've been doing a great job <laughs> the show is still young yeah that's true. <laughs> would you ever go back to industry oh gosh you know so this is funny i just had one of my colleagues from chevron in my office just now and talking about Chevron, and, and I'm, I'm really glad things are going very well there. There's, um, you know, people are very happy. They're starting to travel, they're starting to uh, go to conferences again and so forth. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great things in the industry. And I've already said lots of positive things. Um, oh boy. Um, so I love what I do here. Like when I thought about really good days, you know, you come home from work some days and you just feel really good. Those yep. were the days when I was teaching. Those were the days when I was mm -hmm. mentoring when I was really directing research and conducting research. And every day here at UT, I get to do that. I get to be focused. Like I literally have an open door policy with my undergrads. They can, like I have a class of 40, 60, 70, it doesn't matter. They can come in anytime. They can interrupt me, they can ask questions. And, the, and I tell them it's because I'm selfish. And it's because if all my job was, was to write proposals that are gonna get rejected, I would not be very happy. But if my job is to sit and meet, mentor, and help people understand geostatistics and use it practically in the work to be better engineers and geologists, then I'm a, I'm a happy person. 
That makes me. Yeah. And so last year I was very happy. I got to do that a lot. I really enjoyed what I did. I don't, I'm going to be here for a while. I, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, students I, allegedly were happy with the way I teach. So I don't think I'm going to be kicked out or fired. So I think I'll just keep this gig going for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and how'd you like Austin? Oh, so Austin's home already. Like, it's so oh, yeah. awesome. Like, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm, I like the music scene. I'm very much into live music. I mountain bike, I kayak. Uh, if I can give a little shout out here, Graham is like an awesome kayaker. That guy's like a monster on the water. Just pounding. <laughs> we, we went out there a couple of weekends ago. We pounded 10 miles down and Graham didn't slow down a bit. Like I was panting, just trying to keep up. Now, every time you turn around. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Austin is very outdoorsy. The culture is very good that way. Um, I drive a Jeep with no doors, no roof. And like uh, I, I spend all my time waving at other people who do the same. You know, it's just very kind of an outdoorsy culture. Yeah. I love it. A no doorsy culture. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when are you moving down, Matt? Yeah, it's I, I you know, I've said I've said it before. I do like Austin. It is it's a nice city. So, so I, I totally get it. If you come down, you got to go kayaking with us, okay? Yeah, I'd love that. So I have a question. How? What? <laughs> let me just charge this question politically. What? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be awesome. You ready? <clears throat> Who makes a better professor? Someone who was born and bred through academia to become a professor or someone who worked in industry. Okay. So um, you're asking me, can I duck that question? I have the answer. For nope. <laughs> okay. So I, let me just preface it by saying I have full respect for those on my faculty, my peers, um, who basically are, have gone the academic track the whole way. I'm, I'm not disrespecting that at all. Now, when I was, when I was an undergrad, there were professors like Mackey, Bigger, and so forth, who would just stand up and someone would ask a question and they would just start telling the story. They would answer the question and say, listen, I remember when I was doing this, this is what we thought, this is what happened, we found out this worked. And I just had so much more respect for that. And so when I graduated my PhD, I actually had an offer for a tenure track position right out of my PhD. And it was a great Canadian university, it was wonderful, and I couldn't do it because I personally wanted street cred. I wanted to get out there. And so within Chevron, I got to travel the world, see data sets from all over the world. I got to see how things get done. I got to mentor people who actually do what I teach. And so now when a student asks me a question, I get to do what Dr. Bigger did, Dr. Mackey did. I, mm -hmm. I get to stand up there and say, I remember when I was working in the Gulf of Mexico and we thought the same thing, or we tried to do that. It didn't work. This is what we had to do. And I'll tell you, I had my last, my very last lecture, last term for my undergrads was, I just spent an hour telling them everything they need to know from this course that I just taught them in order to be successful. Just reminding them, like a review saying, you learned this, this is how you could use it. You learned this. And I went through like 10 points. It was really funny because I did it right after the last quiz of the course. I expected every one of my students to walk out. You know, as soon as they finished the quiz, there was no marks. What I was going to talk about wasn't going to be on the final. And they all stuck around and they were really, really interested. Like they, they, they clapped at the end. They were really excited. It was very practical. It was, and I can do that because I spent 13 years in industry. And so I believe that's good. But I also have respect for all the different paths that people use to get at where I'm at now. Hmm. Do um uh, so I, I guess I don't know exactly what what kind of courses you're teaching. Are most of those um, students going? Are they looking to go into industry? Is that their sort of most likely path? Yeah, I, I believe so. Um, the, the, currently, I'm teaching undergrad introduction to geostatistics, which, if in fact, is the only statistics that these petroleum engineers will get. So I have to cover all statistics, all things statistics in that class. Um, and when I teach that class, it's clear they are all looking for jobs in industry. They're all looking to get out there and start, you know, get out of school, make some money, start living, all of that. And so it's a lot of fun because um, I, I teach a class right from day one. I say, this is going to be one of your most valuable classes. And I believe that like as an engineer in industry, the fact mm. that I, I could quantify, characterize uncertainty, you know, work through that um, within every problem I worked with always gave me an edge. Yeah. And, and that's how I teach it to my students. Yeah, yeah, I, to I totally agree with you. It's uh, um, it's one of those things that acts as a differentiator 
you know, when people are looking for someone to join a slightly weird project or something where you're not quite sure where it's going to go or, yeah. or it's, or it's a, you know, um, you know, it, or, or, or conversely, if it's uh, important, I guess <laughs> you need it to go well, um, you know, because it's got like full geo modeling um, deliverable, then I, I feel like you you know that you need people who get the statistics and can do more than the kind of run of the mill excel stuff and <laughs> you know i mean the industry right. picks along like it does because of because of all those people so it's not like they're not contributing but i feel like to see the interesting stuff and get to work with all sorts of people and on all sorts of things it really makes a difference. It would be fun to uh, it'd be fun to think about like what are those sort of edgy, extra mile kind of skills yeah. uh, in, in geoscience. It's definitely one of them. So I, I posted that last lecture on GitHub, and so if anyone's interested to see, based on my experience, what I think were the things that I was able to do and kind of differentiate myself in my career based on geostatistics statistics, it's out there. Yeah, right. Awesome. So check it out. Cool. <laughs> Gotta find that link. Um, I'm looking for so, it. So, <laughs> and, and what about um, like the, I, I, because grad students also have some classes, right? Yeah. Do, have they let you lose on grad students as well? Yeah, you did mention some PhD students yeah. that yeah. you're supervising. So, I am teaching a graduate level course. And um, actually, this is kind of fun. I teach it, it's like a big role playing exercise for the whole term. I, I'm the um, subsurface lead for their project, and every one of them acts like they're my reservoir modeler. Okay, I see. And so during the <laughs> entire term, we go all the way through data collection, data analysis, um, all of the issues around data quality, all the way into um, some type of spatial assessments, estimation, simulation, uncertainty, decision making. And at the very end, we make a decision with those models. And so every week or so, they're presenting to me updates. I expect professional updates as I would, I would expect in team meetings. Um, they have to be very concise and they also provide me with written updates. And so I'm mm. teaching them about technical writing and technical communication at the same time. Nice. And so we go all the way through that. Yeah. And so, so I'm really enjoying that, that to me, there's no final exam. There's no examinations whatsoever. Everything's marked based on presentations and their updates and the final project write up. And the way I see it is that, you know, in industry to succeed, you have to be able to like sit back and think the problem through and, and be able to communicate it well, be able to find a solution, a practical solution. And so that's what I'm testing them on, their ability to do that and work in a team. So I'm okay with them helping each other. All right. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, so I do have grad students. I have three graduate students right now, and I've just secured three more. I'll have, um, I think I might be able to pick up one or two more. So I'll be up to anywhere between six to eight PhD students by this fall. What are they working on? Wow. Okay. So um, this is a lot of fun. I have one PhD student who's working on, you know, process-based models that represent the subsurface using the full physics. Yep. Um, we're looking at how we can distill information from those models, how we can incorporate that within reservoir modeling. So I have one student working on that. I have another student who's building machine learning based proxies using um, boosting trees to try to um, build proxies for flow simulation. Mm -hmm. And so the thinking is that if we run enough models, we run enough flow simulations over a sector model, which is a small model with a reasonable configuration of wells, that we should be able to work out fundamental relationships between heterogeneity, well locations, and overall fluid flow rates from the wells. So we're working on that using machine learning. I have another student who's working on resampling. I presented that at the APG. How do we take numerical reservoir models and how do we do more than forecasting with them? Not just prediction, but actually learning from the model. Because think about it, that subsurface model, there was a geophysicist, a petrophysicist, there was a stratigrapher, there was um, uh, people working all of the other geophysics aspects with 4D seismic, 3D seismic, you got reservoir model, you got engineers working on it, production engineers and so forth, drilling engineers. That model has everybody's best knowledge incorporated into it. And so yep. my thinking, it's a waste if all we do is forecast with that model. We should interrogate that model and learn from the fundamental, that, that three-dimensional reality and all of those uncertainty models that represent the possibilities of that three-dimensional reality 
we should be able to learn from that. And so that's what resampling is all about. So those are the three topics I have PhDs working on now. I have one student who'll be starting in the fall working on induced seismicity. That's an essential problem. That gets at the very social license for us to practice the pro process of exploration and production of oil and gas. If we don't get that right, that, that's a serious issue. Um, I also have another student who's going to be working on unconventionals, and they're going to be focused. They want to work a lot about on machine learning doing that too. So I'll have a student working on unconventionals. And what else do I have? Oh, I have another student who's going to be working very small scale and how do we work scaling relationships. And they're also interested in using statistical learning, machine learning to do that. So that's the six students I know of right now. If I can grab a couple more students, boy, there's so much to do. <laughs> hey, awesome. hey, maybe I should try to recruit a couple of those undergrads who were actually trying to do that induced seismicity. Eh? You saw that, Matt? Yeah, yeah, right. Well, yeah, I, I saw that presentation. I heard about that project. Yeah. Um, where were they? They're Arlington or something? Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so here's an important question, <laughs> what I've been wanting to ask this entire show. <clears throat> do you move all those books into your office by yourself? <laughs> <laughs> So I had a friend help me move them in. Yeah, I like books. I'm old fashioned. I, I actually literally digest books. If you open my books, I scribble in them. I write in them. I like paper. I like touching paper. I find it easier on my eyes. I like to read away from a monitor. Yeah, I got help. <laughs> nice. I like it. I moved recently and many of my prized, prized books did not make the move. It was a very sad day. Huh. Hey, are you guys ready for a statistics question? Oh, no, I'm going to embarrass myself. You don't have to answer. Of course. <laughs> I can plead the fifth. <laughs> That's right. But our audience has been waiting patiently for two <laughs> weeks for this answer because we had the hackathon episode in the middle, which, yes, is still not published yet, and, yes, will come out this week. Uh, but anyway, here's the question, and here's the answer. <clears throat> you have two computers. Sorry, I already messed up. Start again. <clears throat> you have three computers <laughs> with two DIMM slots each. Those are the place where you stick the little memory cards in. Yeah. Computer A has two sticks of DD4 RAM. Computer two has two sticks of DDR3 RAM. Computer Roman numeral three has a stick of DDR4 and a stick of DDR3. So let's say you randomly select a computer. You randomly select a stick of RAM from that computer, which turns out to be DDR4. What's the probability that the remaining stick of RAM in that same computer is DDR4? Matt, did you get my joke about the computer A and the computer 2? Oh, I liked it. Yeah, yeah I heard you snickering. Is that like, that's got to be more common wise or something, isn't it? I have no idea. <laughs> it's a ripped off joke from hundreds of people, I'm sure. You know, you know, my problem is I'm not much of a computer scientist. Oh? So I got caught up trying to think what's the difference between all that RAM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, answer? I actually don't know either. One's faster, I believe. OK. Are you ready for the answer, audience? Yes. Uh, <laughs> the answer is two thirds. Because? Why, Matt? Oh, sorry, I'm fine. That sounds like the Monty question, isn't it? It does, it does sound a bit like the Monty Hall question. Yeah, yeah, the which door? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you can throw away computer number two uh, since you couldn't have gotten DDR4 from it in the first place. So that leaves you, you got to think about the, the total sticks of RAM, not the total computers. That leaves you with three sticks total of RAM remaining in the acceptable except the computers, uh, two of which, of course, are DDR4, two thirds. Cool, huh? Nice. <laughs> the, the power of conditional probabilities. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, everything can be solved by frequentist math. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Matt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, uh, what? Well, I was just going to say. Well, we'll leave we'll leave that one because we yeah was that one that one yeah. that you're pointing at we'll yeah. leave that for another yeah. time. We um, will. But yeah, what are you reading? You've got that on there. Okay, yeah, let's let's go. You're going to go there. Uh -huh. Well, I'll tell you what I'm reading because it's really boring. What are you uh, reading? I'm reading a book. I've started I've started running 
a bit more seriously again and um and just sort of essentially treating all of my history as like irrelevant prehistory and now considering myself my new post 40 self so i can set all my prs again nice forget mm -hmm. about the olden days um <laughs> So I've started really. By, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, he's still freakishly fast for a human being. So yeah, yeah that's that's not, that's he's not. faster. He's faster than you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I would, so there's this fantastic book. If you if you run, uh, or I would say if you do any kind of sort of aerobic exercise and want to like excel at it, you should read Tim Noakes' book, The Law of Running, L O R E Law. It's a massive tome, uh, but it's a fantastic book and uh the the best bit i think the best chapter is where he goes through um the training programs of all of these kind of runners of antiquity um from kind of the late 19th century at least when people started doing sort of organized races and actually had a some concept of training and sort of reviewing what they did for uh for training and goes right through to I guess the last people in there are kind of from the 90s because I think this book was originally published in the late 90s. Um, anyway, if you're into that kind of geeky stuff, it's uh, it's the best running book I've ever read. Cool. So that's I'm, I'm playing my way through that. Um, my reading. Yeah. Oh, my turn? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Hey, you know, Matt, I was thinking, though, during the last Summer Olympics, didn't on CBC, I thought they took Canada's top sprinter and put them in the old style shoes and on the old style surface from okay. like back in the 1920s, just to see how well they would do, like how much of it is technology versus, you know, humanity is stronger now. And yeah, right, right. Better nutrition or something or better training. And it was it was interesting. It really cut a lot of time off. Wow. Oh, really? Yeah, just running those terrible shoes and the surface was not very good. Yeah, yeah. There, that's interesting. I'm, I'll try and dig that out because I, I, it is crazy. Like, I mean, it was considered ungentlemanly to train until like the <laughs> sort of 20s. <laughs> you know, there was, a, in fact, I, I think a lot of a lot of world's best performances at the time were actually by professional runners. But everyone thought that running for money was obscene. So that those records just weren't recorded. They're like they were for betting, and you know, it was for entertainment. They were like it was like going to the dogs or the racehorses or something. You'd go and watch people run like crazy things, like three hundred miles around a track at Crystal <laughs> Palace, and uh, you know, someone would die because they were only <laughs> drinking milk and brandy. <laughs> you know, that's insanity. Uh, and you know, every, every fifty miles, they were allowed a cigar. <laughs> like, kind of, totally mental but yeah. um yeah it, it, there's lots of analysis in this book about like the prog lots of statistics actually about the progression of world records and yeah. what might be the fastest anyone can ever run that kind of thing um and there's a you know i i think like you could probably say the same thing about geoscience uh, it, you know in the health and sports uh, so I'm sort of thinking about especially sports nutrition, but nutrition in general and sports science. There's a bit of a paucity of rigor, I would mm -hmm. say. You know, there's a lot of... Are you drawing some analogy to the geosciences, Matt? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of just like, let's put these in an Excel spreadsheet and then plot these two things and then look at the plot and say what we think about what or, direction things are going in. Or come up with a brand new hierarchy. How do you mean? Or, or, or come up with, often you'll see that it's like, hey, let's classify this in a different way, come up with a brand new hierarchy and then not go right. any further. That does happen quite often. Yeah, yeah just sort of name things. Or yeah. people, or, or there are like curves and it's like looking for sort of change points and saying, well, up to here, we've got one regime and up to the, and then after that, we've got another regime. And you're like, but it's a curve. Yeah. 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 <laughs> How do you know where the regime start and stop? It's so, so arbitrary. Now, given that the fact that we both love the geosciences, we better end this on a positive. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. I just got appointed to the bureau in the Jackson School, so you know this might get me unappointed. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Well, the thing is, all of that just creates opportunity, right? I mean, that's that's the beautiful thing. Quantification and geoscience. Let's do it. 
exactly let's keep doing it um <laughs> but before we before we start or carry on doing it uh what are you reading at the moment What's okay on your bedside table so or this coffee is table? this is awful like i wish it this is a radio show so i can't really show anything right no, we show. Yeah. We do this all the time. Our listeners hate us for it. Okay, yeah. okay. But um, introduction to statistical learning with applications in R. Oh, I absolutely oh. adore this book, and of course, you know, you can go back to the fundamental book where you get into the elements of statistical learning, mm. and um, I, I, it's and once again, it's necessity because this is what I'm literally teaching out of for my machine learning units. Mm -hmm. So I'm. Um, it's very useful. Very useful. So I'm enjoying it a lot. Uh, anybody who hasn't read it, read the first chapter and dive into understand estimation error like just really understand estimation error and the bias i'm more the balance of model bias versus model variance versus the irreducible variance it's 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 fascinating so i anyone who's doing machine learning i recommend that you dive in there and just learn that first chapter so the first chapter of just hold up the book you're talking yeah, about yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the r1 the introduction okay. to statistical um learning yes and just show me inside because i'm a bit of a pictures person yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So what do you want? Which picture do you want to see? I want to see. I want to see that it's got nice pictures. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh! Oh, is this okay. is this good? No, yeah. that's not good, yeah. Matt. Matt, I've seen your pictures online. You expect much more. Okay. Yeah. No, but it's got pictures and there's worked examples and yeah, there's code. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's Sounds even awesome. links to data, so you can actually work out their examples for yourself. Completely repeatable science, there, Matt. I know you like that. That's pretty great, but it's Elsevier, so it's two hundred and forty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no. Uh, man! Wait, wait, I thought he was going to skip that. Okay, Matt. Matt, I'm calling you out, man. This book is available free, free online PDF from the from the actual um, from the publisher. Okay. There you I'm go, Matt. My word. I just dropped I my mic. Hat. Boom. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, I, thought, I love these guys. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for pointing out that that fantastic sounding book. The world's a happy place, man. It's not all paywall. <laughs> I'm to end no, on a happy note. I'm going to I'm going to tell you what I'm reading, and that'll end us on a happy note. I'm reading. I, I just finished reading a book called All Our Wrong Yesterdays. That's not right. I thought it was called All Our Wrong Todays. Anyway, it's one of those titles. Okay. Alain Mestai wrote the book. It is. Um, I, I haven't been reading a lot of sci-fi sci the past few years. And nice. It's, oh, it is a sci-fi, and um, it's a it's a good sci-fi. It really pokes at your heartstrings and pokes at your conception of humanity. So, it's it's recommended. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. A good summer read, maybe. A good summer read. Yeah, that's great. Is it is it suspenseful? Eh. I'll leave you in suspense on that note. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> oh, Matt, uh, why don't you sign us off while I figure out how to use this other computer? Oh, I'd love to. Well, thanks for listening. Episode 79 slash 80. Slash 243. <laughs> slash 243. Thanks very much, Michael Perch. Awesome talking to you. My pleasure. Uplifting messages about reproducibility and open source, uh, open access publishing. Thanks, Graham, as always. Thanks, Matt. See you guys next week on Undersampled Radio, episode 754.